Iran. Ever since my childhood, I've been obsessed with the mind-body problem, really the mind-brain problem, and uh, came here uh, just a few years before you to UCLA to get my PhD in uh, brain research, and then I went bad into investment banking, but that's another story. Um, but I am continuously fascinated by the mind-body problem. And at the end of the day, the fundamental question is, how can brains, material stuff, be conscious? Right. It's a question that I told myself I'll never try to answer, but now I realize I cannot avoid it <laughs> because it is so dominant, pervasive, and really important. So I ask my class, I teach a class in Introduction to Psychobiology. An organism comes down from Mars. How do you decide if it's conscious or not? And I know what they're going to say, so I have the list already planned for the next uh, handout, for the next slide. And they say adaptive problem solving. You want some unwired ability to solve a new problem in a new way. That's one thing. You want an organism to be able to do that, to adapt to the environment. So I say a thermostat. So you know, no, no, it has to be, the range has to be bigger and so, right. and so on. The second thing they say, how about emotions? It has to have emotions, feelings. Okay, let's program a, uh, an amygdala or some kind of a priority system that says, I like this, I like that less, I don't like that, and let me prioritize my actions according to that. I can program that into a computer, not a problem. Then they say something about self, self-awareness. Okay, well, a computer can... I'm turning the problem now into showing that a computer can be made conscious if we are satisfying all these criteria. A representation of the environment, a representation of the self, and the self is part of the environment, and therefore you have some representation of self with a past, a present, and a future. Okay, they're not so happy about that one <laughs> because they say, uh, but that's, you programmed it to do that. Well, evolution programmed me to do that, so yeah. I'm not sure it's different. And then we come to qualia, subjective experience. What is that? You know, the feeling I feel pain now, I see red now. I'm not sure what that is. So I think maybe that is just a metacognitive level of representation where we don't process information about the environment or about decisions, but about the decision. In other words, we are at a higher level that looks at a lower level and talks about it. Seems to me that's what that extra level of consciousness is. Let's assume that that's the case. Meta. Meta cognitive, exactly. Above the cognitive, where we talk about the cognition as if we observe it from above. Not quite the theater view of uh, Dennett, mm -hmm. but something like that. Well, that means two things. First of all, that consciousness is continuous. We have more of it or less of it. Some of my colleagues have less of it than others, mm -hmm. but certainly some animals have it less than others. So humans more than monkeys, monkeys more than dogs, dogs more than cats, and so on. And plants may have it too to some extent in the adaptive behavior, for example. Secondly, it means that not only is it continuous, but that it can change. So let's look at conditions that distort some of these uh, relationships. For example, this metacognitive level. If it is really important for consciousness, then disorders of consciousness should involve some dissociation between what you do and what you know about what you do. And we have examples like that many times in clinical neuropsychology. The split brain is the most obvious example, where the two sides work in parallel, both are conscious, both act in purposeful, intentional manner, and yet they don't necessarily agree. So you ask a patient, a split brain patient, uh, he's, he's talking to me, he's smoking. Um, I say to him, uh, what uh, about your left hand? He says, what about it? Is it ever, do you ever use it? Of course, the left hand is controlled by his right hemisphere, and he's talking to me with his left hemisphere. He mm. says, no, it's kind of useless. I say, what is it doing now? He looks and he's seeing that he's holding the cigarette in it. <laughs> I guess it's useful for something. <laughs> so. We, he was using that information, but not conscious of the fact that he was using it. So it was useful, but not available to his consciousness. We have patients who uh, deny their illness. We have neglect patients who ignore the left half of space, including the diseased left hand, and say, this is not my hand. I cannot use it, even though, in fact, it is their hand. They're not aware of their condition. We have patients with neglect who can do 
some things, but don't know that they can do it. They can perceive things in the left visual half field, but they're not conscious that they are perceiving it. So you show them uh, two houses, one with flames, one without flames. You say, do you see the same picture? Yes. Are they different? No, they're identical. Where would you rather live? And they point to the one without the flames. So they, they are, don't know why. And they don't know why. So part of the brain is processing the information, making a preference, and yet that, that information is not available to consciousness in the sense that it's not verbally reported. So when we say consciousness, we should ask, how do we probe it? If we probe it in terms of purposeful behavior, it may be there, even though it's not available to verbal consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I'm convinced now that consciousness doesn't require language. Why? Because I'm convinced that the right hemisphere has it. So when I drink wine, and I'm trying to describe the difference between different types of wines, I'm not a good, I'm not experienced, I say, it's different. I don't know how. <laughs> I can tell you, I like this one better, but I cannot give you a word for it. The left hemisphere may give me a word for it. This has more tannin, maybe more acidic, maybe more body, mm -hmm. maybe whatever. But that does not mean that I'm not conscious of it. I'm able to act purposefully with that information, but I'm not able to access it verbally. So there are degrees of consciousness, if you wish. David Chalmers, the philosopher, talks about the hard problem, which is not just associating all complicated aspects of cognition or emotion with brain states, but rather how do you create this inner feeling of, 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 of subjective experience, this qualia? Right. And d d does the right brain and the left brain each experience qualia? Yes, I mean, I, the evidence we have is that they do, in the sense that you can probe them and they seem to respond as if they have these qualia, and they sometimes have different qualia. How do we know? Um, the left hemisphere can tell you about it. That's easy. Yeah. The right hemisphere doesn't tell you about it. It has this, you know, the mystique of reticence. It doesn't talk, but you think it's really smart because it, uh, my advisor was like that. He didn't talk much, but when he talked, he talked very wisely. So you think because it doesn't talk, it's smart. But in fact, it does know some things. And when you probe it, but you say, did you feel A or B? It will give you the correct answer. Mm. You, d you generate the possibilities and then it gives you the correct answer. So you have a feeling that they're both independently conscious. And, and, they're, and they're, they're both experience this subjective sense of red or pain or, or, or... As far as we can tell, as far as we can tell, I mean, we show something embarrassing to the right hemisphere. Yes. And the patient gets, starts blushing. And you ask to her, why are you, what do you feel? She says, I feel embarrassed. Why? I have no idea. So here's the experience generated, subjective experience generated in the right hemisphere, but shared by the left because it spreads over parts of the body that are sensed by the other side. So the other side knows that it feels embarrassed, but it has no idea why. But, but could you have different qualia at the same time in, in, in the right and left uh, personality? The must be yes, must be yes. I see different colors in my two eyes. Why couldn't I see different colors in my two hemispheres? Why couldn't I interpret the same experience different? We know that they perceive the world differently. They organize the world differently. They react emotionally differently to the same scene. We have done an experiment in a normal subject mm. where we show very strongly negative scenes and then we measure the psychophysiological reaction to it, blood pulse volume, mm. GSR, heart rate. For one minute after we showed it, was it 10 seconds, even though this is a normal brain, the reaction was much stronger over the right hemisphere when I showed it to the right hemisphere than when I showed it to the left hemisphere. And this is a normal brain where everything is shared. But where it goes first determines the reaction. And the hemispheres do not react the same way. They have different reactions, different emotional responses, and I would argue different consciousness. So if we have two different sides of the brain, can they experience different qualia, different subjective experiences of what it's like to be something or what it's like to ex ha have a, a, an experience? The answer, I can answer this in two levels. On the theoretical level, I must say yes, because I believe that each side is an independent and complete cognitive system with its own sensations, perceptions, memories, language, personality, and consciousness. 
And by that I mean some, including something that has an internal representation of the self mm -hmm. and a metacognitive level that can cognize or operate on the lower levels. And that will give rise, I say, to the qualia, to the subjective experience, because I'm now cognizing about the cognition. Now, in that case, that's my theoretical predilection. Now I need to find examples that show that indeed the same split brain patient can come to two different states of consciousness from the same stimulus. And that is not difficult to show in a split brain patient. It is, it is evident when the two sides want to act differently on the same stimulus. For example, the patient wants to uh, get dressed to go out to, do, to dinner, chooses one dress with one hand another, and another dress with the other hand. In other words, the dress that the first one chooses is not liked, is liked by that side, but is not liked by the other side and is deemed inappropriate. So here's a conscious decision to prefer that dress to all others by one hemisphere, but another conscious decision by the other hemisphere to prefer another dress. That's absolutely fascinating, but, but is that qualia, or, or is it not just one hemisphere sees the same dress, has the same experience, but has had a different uh, uh, memory or a different association, and so it just has a different emotional reaction to the same qualia? That's true, but it seems to me, what is qualia after all? Qualia mm -hmm. depends on prior experience and processing the information in the context of the whole organism's history. And to the extent that we interpret that present sensory experience differently, we must, and we prefer one to, to another, we must have set different qualia. I enjoy the idea, the thought of taking this dress and wearing it. I don't enjoy the idea of taking that dress. Okay, now you're, you're doing this in terms of, of computation. Now I know your background is in computer science. So do you believe that a computer, ultimately, however far in the future, can have the same sort of not just processing power, but the same sort of qualia, subjective, internal experience that we imagine we have in consciousness? Absolutely, absolutely. It seems to me it's just a matter of programming it appropriately. And the tendency in artificial intelligence now is not to design it to do what it does best, but also to try to simulate typical human strategies of evolution, the ability to evolve, the ability to have an emotional representation, this ability to represent the self as part of the environment. Those are all features of the human cognitive system, and we are borrowing it by implementing it on the computer, and to that extent, we are going to make the computer more powerful, eventually able to cognize about its own state, to behave adaptively in new situations, to behave as if it has feelings, in the sense that it prefers some things, doesn't like others. You, but that's the whole point, as if. I know, but I, I, I said as if because I programmed it. Yes, but yes. To, to me and to, to anybody on the outside, he, it has emotions. To anybody on the outside, it has emotions, but does it have emotions and does it have a sense of, 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 of this inner world? That's the question. Yes, and to the extent that I'm a neuroscientist, I don't have it either. I have, you know, evolution has programmed some system for, you know, into me that has something called emotion and it prefers some things and doesn't. I programmed it into the computer. What's the difference? In both cases, we are slaves of that system in some sense it controls or at least affects our behavior. And that's what makes us conscious. Part of the repertoire of the cognitive apparatus, the ability to solve problems adaptively, represent the self, have feelings, cognize about our own state. Once we have that, it seems to me we are conscious. And the computer that will have it is conscious. And there's no question that it will. 